right, so I think we'll just, we'll start. And if anybody joins us late, we do, I know one person is sick, one person is going down to Yonkers for an, uh, an unavoidable thing. Hopefully nobody's dead. Um, all right, so today, welcome back, Woodshop number two, Woodshop Projects. Um, so this is specifically Woodshop Projects, but it's, uh, I feel like it's an overview of how to create, a like how to go through the process of making a project from concept to like finishing it. And it is specifically coached in Woodshop, but a lot of these things are, you know, translate to whatever it is that you're working on. Um, I'm gonna try to unplug things a little bit less today, see if we can manage that. Um, Jared is here with us, this is great over there. And Corey is also here as he is able to with a baby, with a baby. <laughs> so she's welcome to chime in. Um, no, that's a lie. I no. <laughs> That's she will scream cry at some point. Yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't mind. I don't, I know it's going to happen, but it's not good. You're, not you're good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so with that, uh, with, without further ado. All right. So a little bit of review first, um, who has gotten badges already? All right. All right. So I just shared on the Slack earlier today. I don't know if anybody saw it. I realized I hadn't shared. We have a list of suggested badges for each section. Um, I also added it to the pinned post on the Slack channel so you can find it uh, easier. Sounds like most people know how this works, but we'll, we'll run through it anyway. Um, the way I kind of, we don't use levels of tools at Make Haven, but I kind of think of them in levels. It's like level zero, you can just use it. It's a hammer. We trust you can figure it out. Um, level one, you watch a video online and there's a little quiz that once you complete that and pass, it automatically applies to your account. Then there's like level two, which you do the video, you do the quiz, and then you come in and you do the in-person checkout with the facilitator, like some of you did today with the late. Um, and I like to always note that you don't have to just do one badge at a time. Um, stuff like the lathe, like it takes longer. So, you know, that might take up the whole time. But like, if you want to get badged on like three different things in the wood shop, you can just schedule for all of them at once and run through that. So don't feel like you have to like come down here one, <laughs> one, one, you know. Because um, I think all the facilitators are in for three hours. So if you can grab all of their time, feel free. And Comfort, yeah. Um, the flip side of that is don't schedule eight different tools in one half hour plot. Yep. Also, uh, it's a little <laughs> tough to get it all done. Yeah, that's fair. Um, when you go to sign up for a tool, it, um, it will tell you how long an estimated time for that. So, like, table saw like 15 minutes or half hour or something like that. So, just kind of look accordingly and, and schedule. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's those, and then there's a couple machines, all of which are in the metal shop that require a full class to take. And that's a whole separate thing that does have an additional cost because um, we pay the instructor. Um, the person who does the bridge port and the metal lathe is a certified professional in training. Like, you know, so his, I, I pay him a, a, an adult amount of dollars <laughs> to come in and do it. So there is a cost on that. Um, and then there's the Tormach, but I feel like you can do so much in the metal shop without those. I haven't taken any of those classes and I am not stopped in doing any of my, any of my, you know, my stuff. Um, so yeah, after that, you can turn on and use the piece of equipment. Um, we are in the midst of swapping out the badging, the, the swipey system. So, you know, after that, you can turn on, use the piece of equipment. There's maybe a small asterisk on there as we transition to the new, the new system, but um for those of you who've gotten badges so far if you had any any trouble signing up on stuff um any questions anything that was unclear that i didn't already answer because we were talking earlier um though that's a fair you know if you don't mind i will recount your questions because they're good questions 
um, that when you sign up uh, for a facilitator, it's listed as like slot one, slot two, third slot, fourth slot, and that I also sometimes find confusing. Um, it's just based off of when their time starts. And I don't have an easy answer for how to sort that out if it's confusing, other than you could just message the facilitator on Slack and they'll be happy to, we all know that it's not a perfect system. So I don't hesitate to, don't ever hesitate to reach out to an instructor, a facilitator on, on Slack. Um, all right. So I don't know if anybody has started their, their woodshop project yet, um, but here's, you know, we just have a couple that are good, good starts. The one that's blocked by our bars, which I can't move apparently, is a floating wine bottle holder, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. It's just one piece um, that's cut at such an angle that when you put a bottle into it, it counterbalances and holds it there, which as far as I can tell is magic. Uh, <laughs> Um, you could do cutting boards, which you talked about before or last week, charcuterie boards, which are just, I think of it as just simple cutting boards. Really, there's not, a, they're cutting boards with a funny shape, I guess, <laughs> maybe a hole in them, or maybe that's a painter's palette, either way. Um, picture frames do seem like a good starter project. I still find picture frames intimidating. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And we do have somebody who teaches a class on picture frames periodically. He's a teacher. So he has been, he hasn't done it in a couple months because the end of school. Um, bowls on the lathe, birdhouses, super simple. Um, and just, yeah, just some joinery, you know, just trying stuff out. A valid project is always just messing around in the woodshop. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if somebody just came in and said like my woodshop project was like, I tried these three different joineries, I would not only accept, fully accept that, but I would be impressed because <laughs> I can't. <laughs> it's like a dovetail. Dove like if you can make like two bookends, yeah. of just dovetails, that's probably harder than any of the other things on there. Yeah, honestly. Yeah. And then a desk organizer, you definitely could. Though I would save the desk organizer project for when we get to the laser cutter, because that's an excellent project for the laser cutter. And you can, and we'll get into this, but there's like a really cool website where you can like, put in all the specs of what you want for a laser cutting box and it'll like do it. It's it's very, very cool. Um, did anybody already pick a project that they're thinking about? Yeah, tell me, yeah, either, both. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> uh, I wanna try doing a chess piece. And also my mom keeps complaining all her knives need to be sharpened. So I'm gonna use the uh, the nice, sharpener. nice, nice. I have absolutely used Make Haven to just like win kid points, like best kid points, hundred percent. All right. So the the narrative of a woodworking project, and again, these are specific to a woodshop project, but these are really great, just like the steps of how to make a project and make it like work out for you. Um, and we'll kind of go through each of them and talk about them a bit. And please feel free to ask questions or, or anything. Um, so the first one is planning. And that's, you know, just to, I might as well just read this list. Identify what you're doing. I want to make a chess piece. And then identify your constraints. I don't know if it was me. I'm not super good on the lathe. Um, it might be difficult because it's going to be really small. Um, I want to pick the right kind of wood to right, make sure. Material, yeah. Tools. Yeah. Um, am I then going to have to make the other hundred pieces that go with a chessboard? Possibly. Um, a mental picture of the solution, back of the envelope sketch, um, and then an isometric sketch, and then a 3D design. So this kind of continue on. We get more and more complicated. Um, Corey, if you happen to be talkable, you are welcome to take this slide. Yeah, yeah. sure. You understand um, this part better than I do. Absolutely. So the, the big idea here is that when you have a set, uh, when you have a concept, it's really useful to try and figure out what's the simplest version of my goal. Like if you want to make a chess piece, like you were just talking about, how do I make a pawn? Because that's the simplest of the chess pieces. 
And what if I made it, you know, a foot and a half tall, because it might be easier to work not in miniature, right? And so you try it at that scale. So like, yeah, I would have a chess piece. It's not really what I wanted, but maybe in doing that, you learn some tricks or you learn some ideas. Um, so you have an idea about your project is what you need to start off with. A question of like, what do I really want? Generate some ideas about how am I going to go about doing that? Then try building something and then you evaluate it. So like after you've made your foot and a half tall pawn, you decide like, do I want to make a set of yard chest pieces or do I want to like try the little chest pieces? Ask another question, try and go another layer. This is actually, this spiral design process was actually developed by the military some time ago. And you can imagine like, how do we want to make a tank? Well, let's start with a truck and then we add extra metal plating and then, oh yeah, we need windows somehow. And like you go through adding slightly more improvements as you keep going through the cycle. Always having a solution. Thank you. Yeah. And that, yeah, the, the spiral, just like you just keep going around and around until you really settle. Um, isometric paper is also, I didn't know that's what this was called until it's, the last time we did it. This is gross. Uh, I like 3D modeling, but if you don't like a computer for any reason the, and you're good at 3D shapes, this can work really well for the people that still love it. For most, a lot of people now jump onto a computer. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. Um, so designing in Inkscape is a really good first step because you can print it out just on paper to like look at it, what it is that you're doing. Um, we don't go too deep into digital design because that's a section that we'll, you know, we'll look at later in a lot more detail. Um, but Inkscape is a great starter. If you're not familiar with design programs, I feel like Inkscape is fair. I found it fairly accessible and able to kind of manipulate stuff and only yell at the computer a small number of times rather than every single time I try to do something. Um, and Inkscape is free, which is a big, a big plus. And it now also works for Mac. It didn't for a while. And I was very excited when that stopped being the case. Um, and then again, we don't go into this like super detail, but once you eventually have an idea and a design, you can put it into a 3D modeling program like Fusion 360, or there's a couple of them. Um, there might be, a, the next slide might be all of them, I don't remember. Um, but this is actually um, the big piece on this slide is part of the future robot bartender that lives in Corey's dining room. Yeah. <laughs> so all the bottles of liquor will go on those two shelves and then up top, um, is where you put your glass and there's all the funnels, all the, the tubes come out and there's a little website where you tell it what kind of drink you want and then it pours your drink so for you. Sick. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> How long? That is, yes, that is what this, that that is for. How long does it take to make a, a Long Island iced tea? 9.3 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So you can, you know, I watched Corey design this, you know, just kind of in the many iterations and using a 3D modeling program lets you really, it's almost like you're making it in real, you know, in real life, you can spin it around, you can add stuff, you can change stuff. Um, and what's really cool about this, we don't have this image on there, um, but if you're making something like that table that all fits together, you can, in fact, if you go downstairs and look at the table that we have the, um, the, the big, the tablet on, you'll see on the table is a tiny version of it that was done on the laser cutter. So Corey designed it, printed it on the laser cutter first to make sure that it all functionally worked. And then later on went and did it on the Shapoko on you know, a, much, a much larger scale. So that's all you're planning is your, your drawing phase, I guess. Um, prep work, yeah. Figuring out, we mentioned before, like what kind of materials am I going to want for this project? Where am I going to get those materials? Because you could probably get your wood at Home Depot, which is absolutely legitimate. I have many projects that came from Home Depot. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned last week, North Haven Home Depot, much better than Hamden Home Depot. Um, but I also, I have, I have a personal love of a place called Any Reuse in North Haven, 
which if you're not familiar, if you're not familiar with you, absolutely should check it. It's so cool. Um, it's a, it's a company. It's honestly, I think it's just like three people, um, who just rescue supplies. Like when I redid that bench, it's all the wood that I got from them was all flooring from a house that was built in the twenties that was getting demoed. And they just say, they just rescued all the flooring. Um, and it's, they have a, a football size warehouse of reclaimed wood, all types, sizes, and all the prices are negotiable. And like, I paid, I think $22 for all the wood that I got for that bench, whatever, but you know, where you buy your materials can vary. There's lots of options. Um, you know, wood isn't really something you're going to buy online, but what was that place called? The it's called cool. N E as in new England reuse dot U S they definitely have a lot of American flags. It's honestly, it's like, I love that place so much. There's no smoking signs everywhere. And then you walk in and the one behind the desk is just like, how can I help you? <laughs> it's, I love it. I love it so deeply. I've also gotten like panes of glass from there when I was making a picture frame. Like there's so many, it's awesome. It's like, you just go and like, just wander. It's yeah. And they know what, and like, they, they are also woodworkers. They have, they have a Chipoko in the back and they like, they like, they get a bunch of furniture. They have all of Yale, like just like got rid of all of their dormitory furniture and they rescued all of it. And they like break it down and make other stuff out of it. Cause it's like solid wood. Like it's a very cool spot. Um, yeah. So you can purchase, you know, where are you going to purchase your materials? How much are you going to need? Um, always buy an extra, always buy extra, um, letting the wood acclimate. If that's, you know, that is something that honestly I haven't gotten really deep into cause I'm just, I don't know. I'm not that patient. Um, if you're I'm laying a hardwood floor, it matters, but probably yeah. not too much. Yeah, that's fair. Um, squaring before shaping. We talked about squaring last time, but like, you know, just getting your wood into condition to start working on, um, building templates and jigs as you need to, and assembling needed tools. So that's really fair. So Assembling needle, needed tools for the purposes of Make Haven hits a lot of these. Don't assume that a machine is the same setting as the last time you used it. Um, don't assume that, you know, the beds are 90 degrees, you know, like always, always double check. And it's not, you know, we hope that everybody puts a machine back into the position of like, you know, the, whatever the neutral is. But it doesn't always happen. Some, you know, who, for a million reasons that are all fine. Um, it was pretty much assumed that it's assumed that it's not. Yeah, because um, the worst worst case, you've wasted three minutes yeah. checking stuff, um, and best case, you find that oh, it's not at ninety degrees or it's not at one hundred eighty. You know, whatever it is. Um, visually confirming that all the tools you need are present before you start, and that's really valid. That's I think like. If you're, you know, make sure that the bits that you're, you know, you know, we have, but make sure that they're there, make sure that you grab them, um, see what other people are doing, survey, survey the other people in the space, super real, like, is somebody about to clearly move on to the machine that I want to use, is somebody working on a project on the lathe that's like clearly going to take another four hours, you know, I would love to have multiple lathes eventually, but, you know, that's not, not necessarily the case. Cleaning up after yourself is just for shared space in general. I owe, oh, especially in the wood shop, I always make a point to vacuum more than I, to vacuum one more machine than I used. Like I always, I always move, you know, I just, I just do an extra machine. I do the floor around it. Um, Cause especially the wood shop gets real dirty, real dusty. And like, we're all, there's so many of us. If everybody does, 5% more cleanup than they need to, we will be in just excellent shape. And I find vacuuming up sawdust really satisfying. Yeah. Personally, like, I don't know about anybody else, but like, it is a visual success. Yeah. It's like vacuuming. It's like, you can see how good you are at something. Uh, <laughs> and they say, you know, leave it cleaner than you found it, which is really easy because you always find it mess. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. If you ever need to use the jointer for any reason, you will have a vacuuming adventure. And I love that. I don't love that somebody left a mess, but it's, you know, yeah, just a little bit extra every time. 
and you know we're all in good shape um and yeah report any broken equipment there's the out of order signs that we keep on the wall and then just like let anybody know a facilitator an instructor an employee whatever or just put it on slack just in some way so leor knows that i broke something again and he needs to <laughs> fix it there's a it's a leave channel yeah put it in there or in a particular space. yeah yeah absolutely and i i gave to i i know i did the orientation tour for some people but i really like to say like if something breaks don't worry about it it's even if it was broke because you did something that in hindsight was stupid we've all it's fine nobody nobody cares as long as you don't kill somebody yeah like i have broken the sandblaster three times <laughs> I don't know how. I think it. I think it just loves me. It doesn't want anyone other than me to pay attention. No, that's right. Not the case. Um, all right. Templates can help with complex shapes. Do you want to try? I feel like you're a better yeah, person yeah, for this. this uh, last week, um, Brown and Vince with the Barry, probably one of my favorite tools of all time. Um, you can make a template. You can use the, uh, the laser cutter or whatever template you have, and you can match that. As long as it's not terribly thick, you can match that outline with the router really easy. And you can even change it. So if you have a just a plain 2D uh, template, you can add a, a chamfer or add a, a, a curve to it or something like that. That stick on the double sided tape that sounds kind of hokey, but it actually works really well. So, if, you know, let's say you wanted to copy this shape um, in a piece of wood. You make a template or use this, put a piece of double sided tape on it, stick it down on the wood you're going to cut. And then when you run that router bit uh, around the, the work piece, the bearing follows the template and the bit cuts the wood. And it's beautiful. And so it's, that would be to do that, like the bearing would be on the top right. of it instead of on the bottom. But yeah. yeah. So if you're using a round table, the bearing would be on the top and you just run the wood and the the bearing follows the tempo. Um, they have different setups where they have a different size bearing relative to the cutter. So you can actually cut your wood bigger or smaller than your template. Uh, okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk about jigs as well? Yeah, jigs, jigs are fun. <laughs> um, Who doesn't love a dance? You know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, jigs are used to kind of facilitate an odd shape um, or fixturing something. If you wanted to cut this cup, it's very hard to keep it square. You know, how, how do you want to cut it? You make a jig that holds it precisely, then you can cut it um, better. Yeah, jigs are in like a jig is always a tool that is just there to help you do something either per super precisely at a weird angle or repeatable. Repeatable, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jigs Things are that you can't normally hold. Yeah. Like the fence on the saw is basically a jig, but that only really works with things that are square. So if you have something that's not square, oddly shaped, the jig is perfect. Yeah. You can put little clamps on it and stuff like that, make it real. Um, yeah for uh, production work that picture what would you use to kind of match that one um, yes yeah. yeah that's that jig looks like it's for i don't know if that's for there's a piece of wood here there's a couple clamps so that looks like it clamps down that looks like it's screwed down. So there might be something that goes on there, or maybe this goes on an angle. So if you have a really weird angle you want to cut at, um, you set your piece of wood in there. And... I'll admit this one looks confusing. I'm not, you're not alone. Yeah, that looks like you're, that's like a stationary piece right there. Yeah. To get like a, like a 30 degree angle almost on the, uh, the other side. Yep. Yeah. This, this piece may come out. Maybe you can put different pieces in there yeah. for different angles, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. And this whole board slides. There's a, a track right here. Oh, yeah. So there's a strip that's attached to the bottom of the board and that fits into the slot on the table. Oh, so maybe it's square and it fits in here. Yes. Yeah. Then, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. 
that's the one. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I don't think that's our shop. So it's not uh, like, you're not going to find that jig downstairs. Random yeah. internet picture. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh. Totally good. All right. So prep work. We've made sure we have all the things. Cutting. What is it? Measure twice. Cut once. Okay. Yell seven times. Uh, <laughs> this is maybe just my experience. Um, follow your cut list. Dimensions in place are great, but you also want to know how to adapt plans to get the best fit. All right. Yeah, especially I find in woodworking, um, you have to be a little adaptable. You know, like people, when they build a house, the, the plan is very kind of general. They don't, you know, cut, they don't have a, a, a diagram for each two by four, like how long it is. They just said, make this wall here, mm. 90 degrees to this wall. And the framework's going, and they go, all right, they measure, they cut, put it down. Then they measure, all right, cut, put that one in. Then they measure again, cut, put that one in. They don't have like a plan for each piece. So it's okay to be a little adaptable. If I want to make a, a cutting board, I get my random light pieces of wood, and I stick them together, and I go, all right, now, so now that they're stuck together, I'm going to make it 24 inches long. <laughs> I didn't have to have that 24 inch in the, in the beginning plan. But, um, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, and I guess part of being adaptable is that wood changes. Wood is not like a a fully stagnant piece like metal. Like I mean, metal obviously is changeable, but like what you cut metal at is like it's going to stay there. But wood, as you can see, you know, we talked last week about the different you know types of cuts that come out of the different parts of a tree, um, but this also inclu is including some of the flaw I, I hesitate to call it flaws but some of the uh uh Freeze. yeah some of the the fiddling uh that comes with wood and they've got different words you know you can see in the bottom right corner you know twist is when your piece of wood is doing this cupping is when the edges are coming up um crook is when it curves one way, bow is curving in the other direction. Um, and there's different ways to still use those pieces so that you're not getting a weird, funky table, you know, or whatever it is you're making. Yeah. And, you know, as you can kind of see in those, I don't know if they're as visible because they're a little bit smaller, but, you know, you can attach those pieces and then flatten them out so that everything matches at the end. So are those like the, the bottom two figures, are those like examples of what not to do or like examples of what you can do? It's examples of what you can do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm going to have noise here, but uh, <laughs> see that top shadow in the pedalway board, the one that's got a cup? Yeah. yeah. If you have a bunch of cup boards and you're trying to make a tabletop, what the picture in the bottom is showing is alternate the direction of the cupping so that they sort of cancel out. If they all go exactly the same way, like in the very bottom right, then you get a whole potato chip effect as an aggregate. If they're alternating, they sort of cancel out. Gotcha. Okay. So there's tricks if you know how to work with the weirdness of wood. Thank you, Corey. Do you want to guess who made that slide originally? It was Corey. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. All right, I'm just checking to make sure there's anything you want to add on seasonal wood movement, Jared, before I click pass? Yeah, I, I, for the most part, any lumber you get at Home Depot is usually fairly acclimating already. It's not going to change too much. Um, that's Home Depot. If you go to a different lumber yard, you may get something a little more fresh that may move a little bit. Mm. Um, the more moisture, but usually when you, you you cut a tree down, you rough saw it, they stack it up, they let it sit for a while. I don't know how long a while is, like a month or a year or whatever. Sometimes they'll put it in a kiln and they'll take the moisture out. Um, but it still changes over time after that, but not as much. So in general, the stuff you get at a, a box store, it's not going to move around too much. And also for small projects, this is not as relevant. Right. You know, obviously the bigger you get, the more 
this sort of stuff matters. Um, if I'm making a chess piece, it doesn't matter what shape the wood is in. I'm using such a small piece of it that it's fine. All right, tips for good cuts. Oh, I want you to be able to see. Let me see here. Yeah, I love this. Give me my mouse. Keep your, when you're cut, when you're using a handsaw, keep your reflection square in the saw. Do you see how that's like the shadow is straight across? Just such a neat little, <laughs> little tip. Um, yeah, like we were saying, like always get supplies that, you know, get more supplies than you need when you're, if you're getting on the lathe, like plan to make, like plan to make a slightly bigger thing than what you were actually aiming for to give yourself some, some wiggle room, uh, you know, to accommodate, you know, a knot that you didn't see or you just shoving the tool into it by accident. Um, yeah, cut to fit, not to measurements, reduce the knot. Yeah, keep it simple. The more times you got to change something, the more likely it is for something to go wrong. So if you can do all of your cuts on the same setting, do all of them at once. Um, just, and that comes into, that's I think part of the planning of it is just like, what order do I wanna do all of these in? What makes the most sense? What's gonna be the least? I mean, the reason, you know, the industrial revolution in part happened because we figured out, you know, uh, chains, you know, like uh, autumn, the same, one person doing the same step. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, you do all of this piece at this, you know, one person doing one thing. Yeah, because you can just do all of that. And so you're only one person, of course, but you can, you know, do all of the step ones, do all the step twos, do all the step threes, and, you know, in that order. Uh, another thing you might want to keep in mind, I'm in maybe another slide, um, plan ahead to leave extra material that you may need to plant down or fixture. Mm. It's very frustrating to, uh, you know, get to a, a certain step where you got to cut something on a piece of wood or do some sanding or whatever, and you've already got it down to your final shape, but man, I, I, if I just left an inch on either side, I would have planted it down. Something like that. It happens a lot more in a maybe another shop, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just kind of take a run through the whole list of, of all right, what am I going to do to make this? I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. All right, well, when I get to that step, if I don't have enough on this edge, then I won't be able to plant it down. Or how am I going to hold it? Or right. how, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we've cut all the things into pieces. Now we're going to put all the things back together. Um, and you've got, we've got options. We talked about some of these a bit last time. Um, we've got permanent attachments, joinery styles, removable attachments, planning for wood movement, hardware, and mixes. Yeah. Um, so we start with a butt joint. Just wanted to say it, I'll be honest. Uh, but, you know, we were talking before that it's like, you know, if you for your project is like did some joinery, that's cool. And it's like, you know, we've got, so a butt joint is just two pieces together. You drive a nail through it or glue it or whatever. Um, a miter joint is very similar. You're just doing, you know, you do miter joints, you know, that looks like a picture frame. That's what that, you know. That looks like uh, half laps. Um, I've Use done that on your bench. Yeah, I was gonna say I've done one half lap in my whole life, and it was the 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 top um, the top angle or the top option because I needed. I realized I needed one more slat to sit on, and I didn't have a piece that was big enough. Um, so we took two pieces, and I was worried. I didn't want to just put them together because that's what you're sitting on. So like, I wanted it to be stronger than just, you know, just the edges touching. So Corey helped me do a half lap where we just overlapped it. And so rather than having just the edge of wood glued together, I've got a whole, you know, I've got way more surface that's being held together. Um, and I put it in the back, you know, but like still like it's a, it's a much stronger, um, stronger way of doing it. You've got, you know, then there's box joints, which is, yeah, lots of, there's lots of little fingers that slide into each other. Um, like a, I think of box joints as a simpler dovetail in some ways. Um, 
and then rabbit joints i don't actually really know oh okay yeah it's like a more complicated butt joint yeah you just yeah you're giving yourself more surface to to be attached to and there's a billion other types of joints that exist it would be i could we could do a whole a whole course on just that um other ways we talked about some of these last week other ways that you can join stuff you've got you know dowels little ikea pegs um you've got biscuits which i like to say because i now know what that is um bow ties are great if you've got like a, a split in wood a bow tie is a great way to keep that from expanding further uh, just a there's a million do you want to have anything specific you want to add on that agree. there's a million different ways yeah and they all have good uses it's just a matter of what you're looking for i i'm still blown away at the idea of like angled screws that you then fill in with like glue and sawdust so you can't even see that they exist mm -hmm. that's magic um what's it called when you drill the you pre-drill the cabinets Counter sink where it's flush. The counter sink is, is the angle. Yeah, where it yeah. goes in lower. So you use a flathead screw. Yeah, and then you can just like pop it off. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, fastening is two, two categories permanent and not permanent. Your mileage will vary depending on what it is that you want to do. Um, wood glue is permanent, nails are mostly permanent. Um, screws when they're covered by dowels are fairly permanent i mean if you try hard enough nothing's really permanent the that picture <laughs> with the little green oval thing is of two craig jig screws so the one sort of not circled by the green that's just a screw you can even see the screw head in there and then the one that is circled you stuff a dowel in and then you cut it off flush so the screws in there it's just covered with wood and so it would be really hard to get at it that's fair. Also, that's so cool. Could so you? The, go ahead. No, go ahead. So the dowels that you're cutting off to make it flush there? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you're like sliding the dowel in so it's at an angle. And then just, yeah, that's very cool. I love what people, it, there's just so much cool shit that people do when they're making things. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and then removable, every Ikea furniture that you've ever purchased is all <laughs> removable. I guess there are dowels. But you don't glue anything in, so it's right. not really permanent. But right. yeah, uh, screws, bolts, inserts, puzzle-like construction where you just—it's just like held by itself. Um, I've never worked with figure eight fasteners, but it makes a lot of—I can understand its purpose. If you've got a piece that's going to have some movement, you can put the screws in both of those holes, one on each piece. So that there's you're able to get some give to it. Those are for like dining room tables, basically, to put the tabletop on the apron and legs and all the bottom stuff. Mm, that makes sense. Because it's I, like the only it's the only scale where wood movement really matters is like tabletops. Mm -hmm. So it's the only place where they have special fasteners for it. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Mixed media. Um super cool. Uh, we have a guy that one of our members does a lot of this stuff. Um, Corey King, Andrew King. You'll see it. He posts stuff on the, the Made at Haven group sometimes. And he, he works with resin a lot. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. You know, you can do, this is poured. This is, you know, somebody got this wood, built a frame, and then just resin poured into it just resin poured that's yeah almost a ten thousand dollar table um three years ago yeah so you can make some really really cool stuff you can there's so many ways to attach wood to other stuff that you could you know combine it with with metals with stone with i mean really anything um i know there's like within the woodworking world there's like a lot of debates on whether this is real woodworking or not I think I think gatekeeping is kind of silly, but you know, it's you know, I think it looks cool. I would love to have like a table with like I love turtles with like turtles inset in them. Like, how cool would that be? Yeah, oh, <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. One thing with mixing media, it 
especially if it's going to be like outdoors where you find that the temperature varies different materials expand and contract different rates so depending on how you put things together um you know after a year or so being outside and making the bubble line yeah. Um, yeah never underestimate the power of materials shrinking and expanding yeah mother nature doesn't actually care about us at all yeah <laughs> nor our plans also, if you spend ten thousand dollars on a table, don't leave it outside. Yeah. That's, I think, a fair, a fair statement. Um, and then we have finishing. So, yeah, you know, um, let's see, sanding, planing, stains, finish, and paint. All right, this, these are always fun. Um, so, sanding, the higher the number, the softer it is. Like the softer your piece will be at the end. Yeah. So, like an eighty grit is where you start. Like super close. Yeah, and a, 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 a 320 is where you'll end. Um, and you can go, it goes up into the thousands. You can get like, you can make a mirror like finish on wood if you, yeah, if you spend, and I mean, you're spending the, if that is a, that is a labor of love, um, but very doable, very, um, very achievable. So um, we have a bunch of sandpaper downstairs in those two cabinets that are next to the store. So please feel free to, to use them. Yeah. So I have this like table at home and it's already finished, but it's like poorly done. Mm. So I would, it's it's like really thick, like polyurethane, I think. How would you take it off? I'd probably run it through the planer. <laughs> yeah. Flat surface yeah. Depending on how big it is, I would run it through. There's a machine that like is good for doing that and you can really like dial in you can like run it through a bunch of times um you could hand sand it but you would paint it they would you'd be at it yeah. forever they have so. kind of rivers for only your veins and stuff but they're kind of noxious and, yeah um, i know um, people love that orange goo and i hate it yeah. i find it so irritating to use but yeah i would use i would use the the planer yeah, yeah if it's an odd shape or you can't take it apart i mean Kind of limited to yeah, Sammy. Yeah. How big is it? Not so. Oh, okay. <laughs> no good answer then. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, hire someone. That might be the right answer. Yeah. Um, sanding and grain is slow and annoying. Yeah, that's accurate. Is it like not a usual thing or? It's just. Because. Yeah, it's. Most of the time, end grain is so like hard that we don't have to really sand it anyway, uh, depending on, on how you cut the end grain. Um, a lot of hardwood, when you, if you use a chisel or something like that, is a really nice finish. So when you're when you're sanding wood, remember the, the, the bundle of straws analogy. Um, if all the straws are aligned, when you cut something, all those edges of the straws that are cut kind of stick up and they, you know, they're, they're kind of scraggly. So that, that when you sand, that kind of evens them all out. When you cut the end grain, all those little ends are pretty strict. They don't kind of frazzle as much no. as, as the side does. So, um, yeah, it's annoying, and you have to do it every once in a while, but uh, it shouldn't be as involved as like this whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing like an end grain cutting board, mm -hmm. um, Sending it through the planer. I was going to say, great finish. On yeah, it. sending that through the planer. Send everything through the planer. Yeah, yeah. the planer is great. Yeah, I'm actually a big fan of the drum sander. Uh, if you're because some occasionally you'll get tear out on the planer, and the drum sander is even more gentle. The mm -hmm. it's a it's a bit spendy. It's ten dollars to buy a roll of sandpaper. There's always leftover rolls in there. Yeah. And it's totally worth doing the drum sander, which I think is just watch a video and you get the badge. Yeah, I think so. And where is the drum sander located? Right next to the planer. Right in between the planer and the joiner dish. That wasn't a trick question. I couldn't remember. <laughs> um, all right. Speaking of planers, planers, planes and scrapers. Um, we have uh, two facilitators who run a whole class on how to use planers. Um, they're 
very good at what they do. People have been using these. I mean, it's as old as it looks like since the beginning of time. Um, they do a great job of when they're sharp of leaving very smooth, excellent pieces. Um, and it is cleaner. Yeah, experienced woodworkers may prefer this method because it avoids the dust because you make curls of wood rather than 80 pounds of dust. Um, there's definitely a satisfying aspect to it. Um, I don't find it as satisfying as vacuuming up, but it's it's definitely on the list. Um, we have most, I think all of our planners are in the cabinet. I think so. Yeah, um, which is its own badge because these, the reason that they're able to leave such a, like a really nice smooth finish, is they're very sharp. Um, yeah very sharp. I definitely have at least one scar from <laughs> that project. Um, and so we want people like, you can't drop them. You can't like, you have to be careful with them. They're, they're not delicate, but they're precise. Um, but they do it. They do a great job. They're also excellent for, um, well, chisels more so for getting like really good, like inside corners on stuff. If you need to, you know, that like a router can't get to. You can do like all of your inside cutting with a router and then get those corners. Japanese woodworking, um, they very rarely use sandpaper. Um, almost every finish is by a hand plane. And they have competitions where they set the plane and they'll have a piece of wood that's as long as these two tables and they'll they'll draw one shaving. And that shaving is like tissue paper. Tissue paper. And it's like so thin and you drop it and it just kind of does this and they one long piece and it's, it's a <laughs> an art yeah yeah so once you finished you know all the the sanding or the planing or whatever you do if you want to seal it you've got options um finishes so this these are good words i'm just going to read them out loud finishes soak into the wood and kind of add a color to the wood um you can still see the grain, you, you can still see the wood itself. Um, stains are the same. They can, I feel like stains are more meant to change the color than a finish is. Um, and then paints and top covers, we've all touched paint before. I don't think I need to, you know, if you wanna hide a color, if you wanna really seal it, um, if you wanna hide your mistakes, um, paint is, is a good option for that. Epoxy. I, but I've over it's taken me a while, but I've developed some favorites uh, for if it's going to be food related mineral oil and beeswax. There's usually a good mix out there somewhere that's that. Um, and then if it's not going to be for food, I absolutely love and it's a little spendy. So I am hesitant, but Rubio Monocoat is actually really good. And it goes on in one coat instead of like a million coats. Rubio Monocoat. It's a strain. I can anybody wants to ask i have a little bottle on the foundation shelf i think actually yeah. two yeah. green jars yeah i think so yeah um, so it all depends on what you want you know if you're going to have it outside you're going to want to seal it more for real than you know if it's sitting in your living room it all depends and sometimes when you go to get a stain the guy at home depot doesn't listen to you and he gives you paint and then you don't realize it until you already did a coat and you're like, well, I guess we're painting this. I don't, you know, yeah. I know the grain is very pretty on that bench, but only I know that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you want to talk about plywood, Corey? I know how much you love it. You don't have to though. Don't I can. Like yeah. Baby's mostly asleep. Okay. Um, there's a whole... Well, Plywood is interestingly complicated. I have clarified many times to coworkers at a school who just like are happy to plywood's plywood, which is totally reasonable and where just about everybody starts. Um, but there's many different types. Baltic birch is the stuff that you're going to pay north of $100 for, for any one sheet. It's very nice is what woodworkers really, really like. Sandy ply is the stuff you get at Home Depot and Lowe's. It's five layers. The veneers are super thin and it, and it's fine. It's totally fine. It's, I will use it when I need to, um, but if I can avoid it for anything that I'm going to look at regularly, I would. Cabinet grade does not mean that it's better. 
it means the surface finish is a little bit better than sandy ply. So the veneers are very slightly thicker um, and they, they just look a little better so in case you wanted to make cabinets out of them. Sheathing is what you put for like on the side of a house underneath the siding. So it's plywood, it's there, it's solid, but it might have giant voids and, and it's when it's in the store, it has a big blue stripe on the sides. The number of stripes, it's usually one, three, and five are the ones you see. Those refer to the thickness of the sheathing. It's such a commodity material that like they don't care what it looks like. They just care it's the right thickness. So the big blue stripe on the side matters. Um, and then for plywood, there are veneer ratings if you can find them. A looks the best. B is a little worse. D is kind of bad, you know, like as you'd expect. Um, and there's a front and a back to plywood most of the time. So there's a good side and a bad side. It's usually not all the same. And then there's lots of other options too. So like MDF is a dusty material that is the bed for the Shapoko and the Gerber. OSB is like the, it looks like little scraps of wood pressed and glued together. Melamine is basically the same thing as OSB, but it's got a plastic coating. And then hardboard is like what the whiteboards in the room you're in are all made out of. It's thin, it's dense, and sometimes it gets that plastic coating on it. Now, fun fact, this dry erase board without the frame is $20 at Home Depot. Once you add the frame and that little holder, yeah, for the pens, it becomes like 150. It's wild. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right. So what's next? Holy shit, guys, we did so much better on time this time. So proud of myself. Um, I asked Corey for advice for today. And he was like, how many slides you got? How much time? <laughs> um, so what's next? So we are on the second week of woodworking. So by, you know, in theory, by the time we get into class next Thursday, we're going to want to be done or like functionally done um, with whatever it is that you decided to work on. If you're not finished, that's, this is I know, like the goal is a project, a section that nobody's, I'm not going to, we're not kicking anybody out because they didn't finish their project or a section. Like that's not what this is. <laughs> like She won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, decide on a project. We've got the options on the slides, which we put up into you know into Slack, and you can take a look at. Um, you could flip through just YouTube, look at the binder of like project ideas that's downstairs on the the wall, kind of near ish the facilitator board. Um, get your wood. There's a lot in the wood scrap area right now. I would definitely recommend popping back there and just kind of looking at what's back there. there was, I was doing a tour earlier and there's a ton back there. Um, finalize your plans and make a thing. Um, 